Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this FarmDoc webinars presentation. I'm Jonathan Kappas, and today I'll be presenting uh, a webinar on the farm programs and the 2014 Farm Bill. Our format for this webinar will be a 30-minute presentation followed by a 30-minute question and answer session based on questions and comments submitted by webinar attendees. You can submit your questions using the texting window on your screen. We will select questions from those submitted, and you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the webinar. With that introduction, good morning, and let's uh, get started walking through the farm programs from the 2014 Farm Bill. So as most of you know, um, before we get into the details of this program, as most of you know, there are significant changes from the 2008 Farm Bill. The first one is that uh, direct payments, countercyclical payments, acre and sure from the last Farm Bill have been eliminated, so there will be no direct payments for the 2014 crop year. In their place, we have the Price Loss Coverage Program, PLC, or the Agricultural Risk Coverage at the county level, which we're calling County ARC, or Agricultural Risk Coverage at the individual level, individual ARC. We also note up front that the Marketing Assistance Loan Program that includes marketing loan gains and loan deficiency payments um, continues in this farm bill as it did in 2008, with one exception, that's the loan rates for cotton. And while we won't talk about this program in detail today, uh, you should be aware there's a new crop insurance product called the Supplemental Coverage Option, or SCO. However, that program is available only for those commodities in the Price Loss Coverage Program. Also, just an initial note on the payment limits and eligibility provisions in this Farm Bill. Payment limits uh, for this Farm Bill are capped, all payments at $125,000 per person, that's per individual person, and this payment limit is all-inclusive. So any payments under the PLC or ARC programs, but that also includes any marketing loan gains or LDPs, those will be counted against that cap. Uh, Peanuts do have a separate payment limit again in this Farm Bill. And for the adjusted gross income eligibility requirement, if you'll recall from the last farm bill, there was a farm non-farm distinction. That has been done away with, and we have a single adjusted gross income of $900,000. If you have, uh, have earned over, over $900,000 on a three-year rolling average, you'll be ineligible for payments in the year following. All right, so one of the main features of this farm bill is that farms and landowners will be required to make a series of choices. And we're going to walk through those in great detail here this morning. Um, but first, let's get a, a quick overview of what the choices, the decisions um, that will be made. First, these are going to be made for each farm service agency farm. So each farm will make uh, the decisions we're going to talk about. They're going to be made only once. They'll be made by a date determined by FSA and the regulations and they are irrevocable. It means they cannot be changed. The decisions you make cannot be changed during the life of this farm bill. So we've got three basic levels of decision. The first one is whether to retain or reallocate the base acres on the farm. All programs in this farm pay on base acres. The second level of decision is whether or not to update the payment yields for the farm. And finally, we have the program election or selection decision, and that is the decision to choose either the price loss coverage program on a commodity by commodity basis, the county ARC program that can also be selected or elected on a county by commo uh, commodity by commodity basis, that's the county level revenue program, and then there's the individual ARC program or the individual farm level revenue program, that applies to all commodities, that's an all-in program for all the commodities on the farm. One quick note. Um, this, and maybe a caveat for the entire presentation, this presentation is based on the statutory language that was passed by Congress and signed by the President. We're still waiting for the regulations from USDA and the Farm Service Agency, so there are potentially some details that are not covered here that we'll learn about as the regulations are put in place. But uh, what we're presenting here today is based on the bill as it was passed, so um, stay tuned as well as, as, as the Department gets the regulations out. Uh, one other thing of note that, as we say at the very beginning, the decisions are not going to be made now. Uh, we know there's a lot of interest um, and concern about what these decisions do for the crop insurance uh, closing date coming up here in a, in a few days. And these decisions, while they impact the 2014 crop year for Title I, should have no, do not have any impact on your crop insurance decisions for 2014. 
So none of this is going to happen right away, but these are the decisions you will go through uh, when FSA has the programs up and running. So let's first look at this base acre decision. All programs, as we mentioned, the price loss coverage program and both versions of the agriculture risk coverage program pay on base acres. Uh, the farm's total base acres cannot be increased by this reallocation decision, but farmers can elect, farm owners can elect, to either retain the current base acre allocation across the program crops on the farm or reallocate base acres across program crops using the proportion of planted and prevent planted acres in the 2009 to 2012 crop years. Note there are special rules for generic base acres that were once upland cotton base. We will not go into detail on those today, uh, but there is a, a difference there. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the decision to reallocate base with a very simple example. Farm, let's say your FSA farm has 100 base acres. The current allocation on that farm is 55 corn, 35 soybeans, and 10 wheat. From 2009 to 2012, your plantings averaged 75 acres of corn and 25 acres of soybeans. The base acre alternative to reallocate then would be to retain the current allocation of 55, 35, and 10, or to reallocate those base acres to 75 corn and 25 soybeans. So you can update based on those, the more recent plantings, but you are still within the 100 base acres for the farm. And that's the reallocation decision for base acres. For payment yields, one thing to keep in mind, one thing to keep in mind, the payment yields are used only for the price loss coverage program. But farmers can choose to update their payment yields to 90% of the average yields from 2008 to two, through the 2012 crop years. So it's slightly different than the base acre years. This is 2008 to 2012. The update would take them to 90% of the average for those years. Farmers can also, farm owners can also choose to keep their current payment yields at the levels used from the 2008 Farm Bill for the countercyclical payments program. So you can keep everything as is or you can update to 90% of the average yields from 2008 to 2012. Now the third level decisions are the program choice decisions. For each FSA farm, producers and farm owners must choose, and this is a unanimous decision that involves everybody on the farm from the producer to the landowner. Uh, so that would include landlords for those tenant, those uh, farmers who are uh, tenant farmers. So for each program crop, for each program crop, you will choose to either enroll in the price loss coverage program or county agriculture risk coverage, county ARC. That's the county level revenue program. Or for all program crops on the farm, Enroll in, you can choose to enroll all of them in the individual revenue program or the individual agriculture risk coverage ARC program. It is possible then, based on the statutory language, that a farm could choose county ARC and PLC for different crops. For example, maybe your farm would take ARC for the county level ARC for corn and PLC for soybeans. Not that we'd advise anybody to do that, but that is a potential um, choice that could be made. If, however, the individual ARC program is elected, it is for all of the crops. It is for all of the crops on the farm. And thus, you cannot mix and match the individual ARC program with any of the other programs. Also, if you elect county ARC on any crop, it's not eligible for the SCO program. Um, if you elect individual ARC, you also are not eligible for the SCO program. That's the crop insurance, the supplemental coverage program and crop insurance. One thing to note, this has to be a unanimous decision, and it has to be made for the 2014 crop year. We'll know when that decision has to be made when FSA puts the uh, regulations in place and has uh, has begun to conduct the sign-up. That will be for the 2014 crop year, and it will be irrevocable for the life of the Farm Bill. 
If the farm does not make a choice in 2014 on these programs, all crops will default to the price loss coverage program in 2015, and the farm will forfeit any potential 2014 crop year payments. So if a, if a unanimous decision on which program to elect is not made for this crop year in the time frame provided by FSA, please note that, that your farm will default to PLC beginning in 2015, and any, any potential payments for the 2014 crop year will be forfeited. So let's look quickly at the price loss coverage program. This is very similar to the counter-cyclical program uh, payments from the 2008 Farm Bill. And what we have are a series of reference prices. Payments are then triggered whenever the market year average price is below that reference price. You see the reference prices for the commodities on the uh, right-hand side of the screen there. For example, corn is $3.70 a bushel. Uh, one thing to note, the marketing year average is the 12 month average price. This is a national average price for the crop year. Uh, for example, the market year for corn and soybeans will begin in September of 2014 and run through August of 2015. So these payments will then be calculated in 2015 and paid out after October 1 of 2015 for the 2014 crop year. But again, this program operates so that whenever the prices are below the set reference price, payments are triggered. Here's a quick look at the calculations for the price loss coverage program. Your payment rate then is the difference between the reference price and the higher of the market year average price for that crop year or the loan rate for that crop. Your payment then is the payment rate multiplied by the payment yield multiplied again by 85% of the crop's base acres. Note once again that your payment yields can be updated. Your base acres can also be reallocated. So using a very quick example here from McLean County, Illinois, uh, let's look at corn. And let's assume that the market year average price for 2014 is $3.55 a bushel. As you'll recall, the reference price is $3.70 a bushel. That puts your payment rate at 15 cents. If your payment yield has been updated, this presume has been updated 150 bushels per acre, and you've got 100 base acres of corn, you'll see the payment calculation then would be uh, $1,913. That's 15 cents times the payment yield of 150 bushels multiplied by 85% of the 100 base acres for the crop. And that's an example of the price loss coverage program. So let's move on into the agricultural risk coverage program. This is two versions of the revenue program, and we'll walk through the calculations for, the, for them. First, beginning with the county ARC program. What you see here is a series of the calculations that, that are set up for this program. The way we do revenue is you begin with the benchmark. You ben begin by calculating the benchmark revenue. For the county ARC program, the benchmark revenue is the five-year Olympic average yields, county yields multiplied by the five-year Olympic average market year average prices. That's the national average price. So five-year Olympic county yields multiplied by five-year Olympic average uh, national average prices. An Olympic average, of course, is where you drop out the, the year with the highest and the year with the lowest. So in an Olympic average calculation, uh, for the yields, you'll drop out the year with the highest yields and the lowest yields. On the price side, you'll drop out the highest price and the lowest price years. Also note that within this calculation we have what we call um, uh, plug numbers. In any year in which the national average price is below the reference price, the reference price replaces that low price. For the yield calculation, in any year where the yield, the county yield is below 70% of the transitional yield with crop insurance, so 70% below the t, below 70% of the T yield, that 70% of T yield will replace the low county yield in that year. So we set the benchmark. Then we set the guarantee. The guarantee is 86% of the benchmark revenue. That is off of, it's off of that guarantee that payments are triggered. The next calculation in this step is to calculate the actual revenue. That will be the county average yield for that crop year, as determined by USDA, multiplied by that 12-month market year average national price. That sets your actual revenue number. Your payment rate, then, is the guarantee the 86% of the benchmark from above, 
Um, it's the difference between that and the actual revenue, whenever that actual revenue is below the guarantee. One thing to note also on this is we have a maximum. The payment rate cannot exceed 10% of the benchmark revenue. It cannot exceed 10% of the benchmark revenue. In essence, then, where, where this program uh, operates is between 86% and 76% of the benchmark revenue. And finally, you'll see there that the payment will then be your payment rate, as calculated above. And that's multiplied or paid out on 85% of the base acres for the commodity. So this payment is on 85% of the base acres. So here, let's do a quick example of the county ARC program, again, using corn in McLean County, Illinois. You've got prices there from 2009 to 2013. That's our five most recent years. First thing you'll note is that the 2009 price was $3.55. It is replaced by $3.70, the reference price for corn. The numbers in red are the ones that are used in the Olympic average calculation. So even though we replaced $3.55 with $3.70, we end up dropping 2009 in the price calculation because it's the lowest yield here. And then next to that, you'll see uh, the county yields. And you'll see that we dropped 2012 and 2013 as the high and low yields. So our five-year Olympic average price is $5.30 in this example, and the five-year average county yield would be 171.7 uh, bushels the acre. That calculates to a benchmark of $910 per acre. At 86%, the guarantee then is $783. Moving on through the calculations, let's presume a 2014 market year average price using USDA estimates of $3.90 a bushel for corn. And we're going to use the trend yield for this county uh, and put it at 180 bushels per acre. And we're just going to assume a simple 100 base acres of corn in this example. That would calculate a 2014 actual revenue of $702 per acre. Your guarantee is $783. That puts the maximum payment Excuse me, then we also calculate the maximum payment, which is 10% of the benchmark. Remember, the benchmark was $910. The difference between 783 and 702 is 81. So first we note we're below the maximum payment, but we have $81 per acre as the payment rate, and that will be paid on 85% of the 100 base acres for corn in this example. So the payment in this example will be $6,852. Here you see a calculation for soybeans. Uh, again, the same type of calculation to get to a benchmark of $669 per acre, and a guarantee on 86% of that is $575. Again, using a USDA estimate of $965 for soybeans on the 2014 crop year market year average, and a trend yield of 56 bushels the acre. We're just going to assume 100 base acres of soybeans. You can see your actual revenue would be $540 and a payment rate would be $35 per acre, or $2,982 on that 85% of the 100 base acres of soybeans. So that is the county. Uh, the <laughs> operates. First, the program operates on the sum of all covered commodities on all farms enrolled in the individual R. Again, on this note, the individual ARC program operates on the sum of all, of all covered commodities on all farms enrolled in individual ARC. That's why you'll recall, as uh, noted earlier, that you're all in or all out of ARC. You cannot choose this as a uh, option on different commodities. You, all your covered commodities are in this program. Also, the calculations for individual ARC are based on the producer's share of the production on all farms in the state that are enrolled in the individual ARC program. So the producer's share of those farms is going to matter uh, it's going to be calculated as part of this AR, individual ARC calculation. Also note up front that the planted acres in the crop year will determine the weights used to calculate the revenue numbers, the actual and the benchmark, in this program's calculation. 
And finally, note that payments for individual ARC are made on 65% of the base acres for all program crops on the farm. So you'll recall PLC is on 85% of the base acres for the commodity. County ARC is on 85% of the base acres for the commodity. Individual ARC is on 65% of the base acres for all of the commodities on the farm, all the program crops. So here we are uh, starting with the calculations for individual ARC. Again, we, we start by calculating the benchmark revenue. First, we calculate each program crop's revenue for each of the five most recent crop years. You calculate each crop individually and each year individually. So price times the market year average, or the, the yield times the market year average price. Again, in the uh, individual ARC program, any time the prices fall below the reference price, you replace the reference price in the calculation. Any time yields fall below 70% of a T yield, then you replace those. The Olympic average revenues is the next step in the calculation. So now you've, you've calculated five years of revenue. Now you take the Olympic average of those revenues. That means you drop the highest and lowest revenue. You do this for each of the commodities on the farm. Then you weight this, those revenues and add them together. So the current year's planted acreage is what's used as the weights on each of those revenues. You weight them and then you add them together to get one benchmark revenue for the entire farm. Now, the next thing you do is you'll calculate the actual revenue. So calculate the revenue for each crop. That's the farm level yield for the crop times the market year average for the crop year. Again, the planted acres will be used to weight the actual revenue. So once you get a revenue for each crop, you weight it based on what was planted that year and then you add those all together. That gives you an actual revenue. So now we take the benchmark, we multiply it by 86% to get the guarantee. We have our weighted revenues to, to uh, make up the actual revenue. And your payment rate again is, is the guarantee, which is 86% of the benchmark, uh, minus the actual revenue, the difference. Much like we have in county ARC, uh, this payment rate cannot exceed 10% of the benchmark revenue. So again, this will be 86% down to 76%. Now we're at the individual yields across all crops. Your payment then is the payment rate as calculated above, the difference between the guarantee and the actual, and that's paid on 65% of the base acres for all program crops on the farm. And that's the individual ARC program calculation. Here's an example of that. We're using McLean County again. Uh, we're using corn and soybeans, and uh, even though we're on the individual farm, we don't have an individual farm in this case, so we're just going to use the county numbers we used above to, uh, to calculate as, as though they were an individual farm level uh, set of yields. The prices are going to stay the same because they're national prices, so we're using county yields in, as a representation or as a, an example here for an individual. And so what you see is you calculate across, right? You calculate the yield times the price to get you to the revenue across each year. Then you do the Olympic average. That gets you to an 826 Olympic average revenue for corn and a 687 Olympic average revenue for soybeans. Notice again that the $3.55 market year average price in 2009 is replaced with the reference price. It's still the lowest price in the five years, so it is dropped. The numbers in red are the numbers used for the Olympic average. Continuing with this example then, let's uh, assume that we have a $3.90 market year average corn price for 2014. We'll use the trend yield for corn again at 180 bushels per acre and the soybean 965 uh, market year average price with a trend yield of 56 bushels per acre. Let's also assume we got, these 100, we got 100 base acres but we've planted 60 of them to corn and 40 to soybeans in 2014. So those will serve as the weights. As you see then, your benchmark revenue would be $770 per acre. That's 0 0.6 times the $826 Olympic average revenue for corn and 0.4 multiplied by the 687, which is the Olympic average revenue for soybeans. At 86% of that benchmark then, your guarantee would be $662 per acre. The actual revenue, again using the actual planted acres to weight the revenues, we have 0.6 times the 702, which is the actual revenue for corn that year, 
and the 0.4 times 540, the actual revenue for soybeans. That produces a payment rate of $25 per acre. The benchmark is 770, so 10% of that is $77. That's the maximum payment. We're not there, so we will use the $25 per acre. On, paid on 65% of these 100 total base acres would be a payment of $1,631. So those are the calculations uh, and the way the programs are anticipated to operate. Again, the caveat being we will need to see the regulations from FSA. Um, we thought we'd try to do some quick initial conclusions based on what uh, what what is coming through as, as we start running different estimates and numbers on, on these programs. So the first conclusion that comes out of this, presuming trend yields for corn and soybeans, the county ARC program in 2014 would reach the cap, that's the 10% of the benchmark in most Midwestern counties at prices that are well above the reference prices in the PLC program, but are below where USDA is projecting the prices to go. We also think it, just initially that the, uh, the individual ARC payments are going to likely be smaller, and of course that would, would uh, obviously be from the fact that we're paying on 65% of the base acres instead of 85%. Continuing with some initial conclusions, uh, certainly with the high prices of the last five years, this revenue program is really going to be uh, operating based on price movements. So if you look at corn, you've got a $3.70 reference price. If the market year average prices stay above that number, it's possible that county ARC will provide assistance for price declines, but the price loss coverage program will not. Again. The, the way the price or loss coverage program operates is you have to be below the reference price. That reference price doesn't move. Um, it stays at $3.70 for every year. And so let, the only way it makes a payment is if the, ref, if the market year average prices go below it. If, however, market year average prices are extremely low, probably in the $3 or less range, it's possible PLC might provide more assistance. Uh, and that's even more so in, in years four and five. This is due to this this uh, rolling five-year Olympic average calculation in the county ARC program. Uh, it's going to pick up the, the high prices of the last couple of years, but as those years roll out of the equation, you're going to be, and, and prices, if prices stay low, then you're going to be calculating lower prices into the equation. So it's possible uh, that if prices go to $3 or less and stay down there, that you might see more assistance out of the PLC program, and that certainly is probably more the case in the last two years once the five-year average has, has moved into those lower prices. For soybeans, uh, the reference price is $8.40 a bushel. Right now, all the forecasts for the market year averages in the next five years that, that, that we've seen, those forecasts are well above the reference price. In which case, that means the soybean prices are going to stay above that reference prices. That would mean that the uh, county ARC program will provide assistance with, with declines, but the price loss coverage will not, so long as the prices stay above the reference price. So really what this boils down to right now, looking at the last five years, is kind of uh, for farmers, as you, as you try to sort through these, these decisions, it's, uh, it's putting a lot of, of, of weight on what you think prices are going to do. What are your expectations for prices? And probably more important for your farm operation are your financials, what you need to see to deal with input prices, particularly as they stay up in these initial years, uh, land rents, so on and so forth. So what are your price expectations? The only way the price loss coverage program can be effective for Midwestern corn and soybeans is for uh, a price collapse, something that gets, gets the prices below the PLC reference price and they'll have to stay there. The county ARC program guarantee will decline if prices remain low. Again, we're calculating using the, the most recent five years. If, those, if you start pulling in more and more of the low prices in that five-year calculation, the guarantee level, the 86% of the benchmark, will decline with prices. A couple points just to keep in mind then. Um, county ARC on a commodity. So if you take county ARC on corn, for example, Corn on your farm is ineligible for the price loss coverage program and is also ineligible for the supplemental coverage option that is in the crop insurance. It's a new program of crop insurance. It will not be uh, up and running until 2015, 
but the decisions you make for 2014 for your Title I program could impact whether you're eligible for SCO. Again, the individual ARC, because all the co uh, covered commodities on the farm are included in that program, that means, that means the entire farm will be ineligible for PLC and SCO. You cannot mix and match SCO and the ARC programs. And with that, I think we'll look to questions and try to provide some answers as we go. First question we have is whether or not CRP payments, that's the Conservation Reserve Program, whether those payments count towards the $125,000 payment limit that's for Title I. Uh, the answer is no. Um, the $125,000 limit is for all of the programs in the commodity title, and that's price loss coverage, ARC, agriculture risk coverage, and this time around it includes the, uh, the market uh, marketing assistance loan programs, so any loan deficiency payments or marketing loan gains, those are all included in your $125,000 cap. Uh, the Conservation Reserve Program is in Title II. It is not included in that cap. The next question we have is whether or not it's the owner or the operator that initiates the base update. Uh, it's a good question, and I, I think uh, the way we point first and foremost to that is, is going to be based on how uh, FSA um, sets up these, these elections and decisions in the regulation process. Looking at the statutory language, um, because base acres uh, run with the farm, they're, they're going to be with the landowner. Uh, we, and, and the way the language of the statute sets up, it says that the, the farm's owner is the one that makes the decision on updating base acres or reallocating base acres. So that decision will, will uh, ultimately rest with that, that farm owner. Who initiates it uh, is a great question for the details of the sign-up, and I think we'll have to wait and see what FSA says in the regulation. So the next question we have is a, it's, uh, whether a producer with multiple farm numbers could select ARC for one and PLC for another. So again, the way the, the statute reads, and, and a lot of these details will be very dependent on the regulations and um, coming out of FSA. The way the statute reads is that these are on the FSA farms. If you have multiple FSA farms, uh, the anticipation or the expectation is that you'll be making multiple decisions, a decision for each farm, uh, which would initially, um, initially lead us to conclude that it is possible to have uh, different programs on those different farm numbers and that you'll be um, making that decision in that way. Again, I think uh, some of those details are, are going to be need to work are going to need to be worked out uh, through the regulatory process with FSA. Okay, our next question: uh, Producer has 100 acres corn base, plans to plant soybeans in 2014 and wheat in 2015. Can they choose ARC for one crop and PLC for another? So, the key here is that. It, what you plant. These programs both, or all three of them, operate on base acres. So uh, with the exception of the individual ARC program uses your planted acres in its calculation, uh, these are base acre programs. So that means they're decoupled from your production decisions for the most part. Um, it's possible to choose county ARC for one crop and PLC for the other. You cannot do that with individual ARC. Individual ARC is all crops together, but it is possible you could have county ARC on one commodity and the, and the uh, price loss coverage program on another. Uh, best guess on open enrollment for Title I. The best guess we have is, uh, I think, based on comments the Secretary made at Commodity Classic last week in which he said he did not anticipate uh, sign-up starting until this fall. Um, so we certainly... Uh, We'll wait to see um, how they roll things out and, and probably get better updates here this, later this spring and summer. But right now, the, the only word we've heard from uh, USDA is that it'll be in the fall. T-yield, uh, what is T-yield? This is the transitional yield that's calculated by uh, RMA for crop insurance. Um, they use that in the crop insurance program to plug in uh, um, this sort of bridge yield, if you will, for years that have extremely low yields. It is not a, uh, it's not an FSA um, yield. It's not something that, that's 
been in the programs in the past that I'm aware of. So it'll be using crop insurance information. Um, I believe they usually use the county, they use a county average yield to, uh, to, to calculate that transitional yield. And what they'll do then is, is whenever you're below 70% of that, that transitional yield, and that 70% of the transitional yield number will be used in the, uh, in the revenue calculation. But it is, it is a crop insurance number. All right, so the next question we have here is, uh, when would an ARC payment be received if one were triggered? So great question. Again, all of these programs, you, you will recall, are using the 12-month market year average national price. That will be calculated at USDA. They base it on the, on the prices farmers have received throughout the market year. Uh, using corn and soybeans as an example, the market year begins in September of 2014. So the 2014 crop we plant this spring, you'll harvest in the fall. The market year begins in September of 2014. It runs for the next 12 months through August of 2015. So the market year average price won't be known until sometime after August 2015. The, the language in the bill states that no payments can be made in, before October 1. Um, so that means you calculate that 12-month average price. We should know that in, Octo in August or September. And the payments will not go out until October 1 of 2015 for the 2014 crop year. Again, payments for PLC and the ARC programs will not, for 2014 crop year will not be made until October of 2015. Okay, the next question we have, does enrollment in individual ARC require all FSNs in the state be enrolled in that program? That's a, that's a really good question. I think that's one of those we're going to have to wait on the regulations at FSA to, uh, to understand better. Uh, what we know from the statute is that the producer's share of all farms in the state that are enrolled in individual ARC are calculated together for that producer. Um, it does not appear there's any requirement that, that, that all farms for that producer be in the individual ARC program. Um, so our best guess at this time is that, uh, that the way that reads that, that it won't require all of them to be in the, the same program. Again, going back to the capability of of making different elections for different FSA farms, but uh, the big caveat being um, until we see the regulations, we, uh, we don't know exactly how they're going to uh, require this to operate. So right now it doesn't look like you'd be required to put all farms in, but all farms that you do have in will be calculated uh, based on the producer's share in those farms. Let's see, we got the next question here. Um, producer has soybean base but leaving the land idle. Will they be eligible for soybean PLC or ARC payments if one is triggered? All right, so going back again to the fact that we're on base acres, that means they're decoupled from production. So this, the PLC program and the county ARC program will not uh, have, it will not matter whether or not you're planting the soybeans if you have soybean base. One exception to that is if the, pro, if the farm is in uh, the individual ARC program and no crop, no soybean crop are planted. Remember, we use the planted acres for that crop year as the way to weight uh, the revenue numbers. So while you're not required to plant the crop uh, on the individual ARC program, it appears from the, the way it's set up that, that that crop year's plantings will have an impact on the way your revenue numbers are calculated. Again, that's because we weight those revenues based on plantings, um, in essence, so that you could, not, uh, you could not trigger a payment simply by not planting one of the commodities. Um, that kind of allows the actual and the guarantee to be sort of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, uh, utilizing the same proportion of planted acres. But for county ARC and for PLC, those, those programs are fully decoupled. That means you do not have to plant the crop on the base acre to get the pay payment if it's triggered, much like uh, the way the counter cyclical program uh, ran from the 2008 Farm Bill. Next question is, is whether there's a cup or cap or limits on the movement in the ARC revenue guarantees across the years. So the first part of that, no, there, there is not a cup or cap. Uh, the, the way the program calculates revenues across the years is using the Olympic average. Uh, so there's no up or down, there's no top side or downside um, limit on the movement. 
Um, those will use the actual prices and yields uh, from the previous five years. So there's no cup or cap involved. So looking here at some other questions we've got coming up. Next question we have are whether or not hay acres are included in base. Um, what we do know that's included in the base calculation, including the reallocation, is if the crop has been planted for haying and grazing or for silage, uh, that those planted acres will be included. Um, hay itself is not a covered commodity, so there was not a base acre for hay. Hopefully that answers that question. If acreage has been in CRP but it's coming out, that's a good question. What, the CRP program where you have a contract expiring or acres are otherwise coming out of the CRP program, those acres will be calculated. Um, they will come back into being the base acres they were before. Um, and there are some specific uh, provisions in the bill on how the, the program election is treated and uh, you know the way you calculate your entire base. Again, the, you cannot increase your base. You cannot, and there's also language in there that you'd have to reduce uh, base acres anytime you're above the actual acres for the farm, and that would include acres coming out of the CRP. So those, the, the expiring CRP base acres um, come back into play on the farm once the contract is over and the acres are out of the program. Uh, there's language in there to prevent um, or to avoid uh, a, a CRP payment at the same time you'd get a, an ARC or PLC payment. But those, program, those base acres will then come back into the farm's base. Uh, this is much the same way that, that, uh, that, has, been ha that has been going on with, with the base acres since 2002 and 2008. Uh, the next question we have is what happens when a farmer uh, changes landlords? Can program choices be changed? So taking the second question first, program choices, the election between are among the PLC, the county ARC, and the individual ARC program, those elections, those decisions are irrevocable. They cannot be changed for the life of this farm bill. Um, this, the first part of that question is what happens if you change landlords? Well, and it's, a, it's a really good question because it's one of the things that FSA is going to have to sort out a little bit with, uh, in, the, in the regulations again. But the programs pay on base acres. Uh, the requirement is that uh, the farm owner, the landowner, the owner of that base be involved in the decision and it be a unanimous decision with the producer. In a case where they elect one program on the base and then uh, the producer moves on to another farm or there's a new tenant, uh, the way it looks in the statute that program stays with those base acres. So any new tenant will operate under the program that's on the base acres for the farm. And the tenant that moves off of that farm then and, and rents land with another landlord or adds uh, land from another landlord, the program choices made on the base acres for the new farm, for the new land, will remain with that one. So it, 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 uh, the program choice, the program election stays with those base acres that are on the farm, uh, regardless of who the tenant is. But the tenant is, the, uh, is involved in the original decision. Um, and a lot of those details, uh, including uh, how the, the signature authority and, and everything that goes on between landlords and tenants, that's going to have to be worked out uh, by the agency as they put the regulations together. Um, but the way the statute reads is, is that the, uh, as a base acre, the program decisions will will stay um, with those base acres regardless of the tenant. So uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of questions right now on the supplemental coverage option, our SCO program. Uh, as we mentioned up front, SCO is a brand new crop insurance program. It'll operate like a crop insurance program. Uh, it uses county yields. Uh, the guarantee is set at 86%. It calculates using the county yields and the crop insurance prices. It is not a Title I program. It will not be up and operating until 2015, so it's not available for this crop year. 
we're going to do another webinar next week uh, where Nick Paulson from, from the university will be going through the details of SEO. Um, but certainly just to keep in mind, the main thing to keep in mind about SEO and this discussion of Title I is the fact that your decision on Title I could impact your eligibility for SEO. You cannot have SEO and county ARC on the same commodities. Uh, um, in the same vein, you cannot have SEO on any farm that has elected the individual ARC program. So uh, you've got to keep that in mind, even though you're not signing up for SEO this year, your decision on Title I will impact your eligibility for the supplemental coverage option. Supplemental coverage is a crop insurance program. It's not a Title I program. I've been asked many times whether there's any other linkage with crop insurance in these Title I programs, and there's not. There's no requirement that you buy crop insurance to be eligible for PLC or either of the ARC programs. But again, if you are in either of the ARC programs, it will limit your eligibility for the supplemental coverage option, which is a crop insurance program, also based at the county level, also with an 86% guarantee. The other difference with SEO is you, you supplement your individual crop insurance purchase. So if you were to, if you were to be at, say, 70% uh, revenue coverage on, the end of, on your farm, um, an SEO program then could be, uh, could be added in to go from 70% to 86% at the county level. So your leverage of individual coverage uh, for your farm will determine the size of the of SEO. But again, we'll get into a lot more detail about SEO next week. Um, the main thing to remember with these Title I programs is that uh, the ARC programs will limit your eligibility for SEO. Next question we have is for uh, seed corn and soybeans um, as well as vegetables. So how do these programs work for that? Um, the seed, corn, and soybeans are not listed as covered commodities. Uh, so we'll see if, uh, if there's any uh, further details in the regulation. Um, one thing to note on the vegetables, so non-program crops in the past, um, there has been a restriction on being able to plant non-program crops on your base acres. Uh, this year is a different, this farm bill provides a different or a change in the way that operates. In the past, you were limited. You could not plant non-program crops on base acres. The way the language reads for this go around for the 2014 Farm Bill is that you have a, more flexibility in, in regard to planting uh, non-program crops on base acres. So keeping in mind that PLC and county ARC pay on 85% of, of the base acres for the commodity, uh, in the case of vegetables or non-program crops, you have that 15% that's, that's not calculated in the program is available, can be planted to a non-program crop, to a fruit or vegetable. Um, and if you plant more than 15% of your base to the vegetable, the payment acres, so the 85% of the base, will be lowered to reflect that. So using our simple 100 base acre example, um, and say you've got 100 base acres of soybeans, um, you're in the county ARC program, it would pay on 85 of those base acres. So 15 of those acres could be planted to a non-program crop, to, to a vegetable crop. There's no uh, uh, cross-subsidy issue there. Um, if you were to, say, plant 20 acres of your 100 base to the vegetable crop, what ends, up, what ends up happening then is your county ARC payment in that case would only be made on 80% of your base acres. So in essence, you know, you're, you're trading out some of the, the base acres that would receive a, a, county, a county ARC payment uh, for vegetables, and you can't, you can't get both on the same acres. But, but the, um, there's no restriction at this point. It just would lower the, uh, the actual number of acres um, that you receive payment from the Title I programs. So that goes for county ARC and uh, price loss coverage. Remember that the individual ARC pays on 65% of the base acres. So if you're in the individual ARC, you have a little more flexibility um, because 
again, assuming the 100 total base acres, that you're getting paid on 65 of those. The remainder of those acres, so the 35 acres that are not um, receiving a payment, could be planted to a non-program crop. Um, so again, the, 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 the payment uh, acres determine um, some of that flexibility. And then if you do plant above that, if you plant more vegetables than, than that 15% or that 35%, um, your payments will be reduced uh, based on those additional acres. More of those details obviously will be forthcoming in the, in the regulations. See, so the next question we have is what is the income measure uh, used for the 900,000 AGI eligibility requirement? So uh, this is adjusted gross income um, for the farm, for the individual. And, excuse me, for the individual. It's the, the adjusted gross income. It uses the most recent three years. It averages those three years on a rolling average basis. So that changes uh, as you go forward. And that three-year average, if it's above $900,000 of adjusted gross income, then you're ineligible, ineligible for payments in the year that, um, that we're looking at. So for 2014, if your last three years average out to above 900000 The difference um, from 2014 uh, compared to 2008 in the 2008 Farm Bill, there was a farm AGI requirement and a non-farm AGI requirement. And that required an understanding of, of uh, the different income that is, uh, that's coming in. This time around, you don't have that. There's not a distinction between farm and non-farm. It is one straight AGI. Whatever the adjusted gross income is, that, that's what's calculated. Everything together, uh, one, uh, one calculation. So there's no longer a farm, non-farm distinction. Next question we have, what happens in 2018, especially if the next farm bill drags on like the past two? Well, let's first hope that the next farm bill does not drag on as much as the last two have. Um, the question is, will we be stuck with our choice made this year after 2018? Uh, it's a tough question to answer at this point in time. The only thing we have to go on is how um, FSA treated acre when the 2008 farm bill was extended. We presume the same kind of treatment that that, that decision rolls, but we do not know at this point in time. Um, if the Farm Bill were extended simply from 2018 to 2019, um, I think the initial presumption would be that your choices made will, will continue um, because there's not an opportunity to make that choice. The statute is very clear that it's irrevocable. It cannot be changed. So if I had to make an initial presumption, it would be that, that your choices would be extended with the Farm Bill. but uh, at this point in time, we do not know. Um, that's simply something that the Farm Service Agency will have to uh, work out when they put the regulations together. It's a great question, and um, like I said, hopefully we don't have to worry about it. Hopefully we get the next Farm Bill uh, completed in a timely manner. Let's see here. Our next question. Do CRP or CSP programs have their own separate payment limits? I believe they do. Um, I don't know those payment limits off the top of my head. Um, I, I do believe there are eligibility requirements and payment limits as well. We can, uh, we can pull that information together uh, and get it out um, when we can here from the farm doc team. Next question is, why would a farmer not reallocate base acres? It's a very good question. Um, Again, this is going to depend on your farm, and you've you got to remember you're, you're looking at what you've planted um, the last few years as your determination. So obviously, uh, one of the first things you're going, to, you're going to look at when you try to determine that, so remember we're in 2009 to 2012 crop years. What were your average plantings of what crops from 2009 to 2012? That includes any acres that you were prevented from planting because of weather, because of natural disaster issues. So reallocation may not make sense um, uh, if you've not planted your base or haven't planted 100% of your base. Um, you may not want to reallocate depending on what, what base acres you have um, and depending on your, your uh, program choices. It's possible that the base acre decision would reduce, uh, you know, reduce the acres of a crop that um, 
know that that may that maybe have uh, may trigger more payments in the coming years. So it, it's going to be a decision that you want to look both backwards, backwards to your 2009 and 12 uh, plantings, but also kind of looking forward about what you think these programs might do and what they might provide and which one's going to be effective on your farm. And you're going to kind of uh, you're going to look at those together to see exactly. Um, what it's going to mean for your farm if you reallocate the base acres. Uh, I know we're currently trying to work through some examples and some other information to provide uh, a little more detail on that, um, but this is going to be a farm level uh, decision and, and, and the information on your farm is really going to determine that. Um, and at this point in time, it's, it's a little hard to, to provide any guidance on what may or may not make sense for uh, base reallocation, but those sort of things. What base acres do you have now? What have you been planting the last, uh, back, going back to 2009? Um, those are the, some of the things you would look at uh, very closely in that decision. And then, of course, your program decision and what you think those programs might do in the coming years. Um, so you know, what they might mean, say, if you've got corn or soybeans, um, what they might mean for those, those commodities on your farm and whether or not you can increase um, the allocation of base acres for the commodities uh, with a program that's, that's effective for them. So I think you're going to have to look at both of those um, on your farm. Uh, the next question here, could you go back through the ARC payment scenario calculation slide using the USDA baseline price of 2014? Certainly. Again, keep, keep in mind we're using, this is just an example, so these aren't, uh, we're not, we do not have uh, uh, such a great crystal ball to know what prices are going to be for 2014. So we're just using the USDA estimates. Um, but looking back at the county ARC program, um, I put back up on the on the screen here the the benchmark calculation. So you see uh, we've got a we're using a five-year Olympic average of prices, five-year Olympic average of yields. This is the county ARC. Uh, so we begin this calculation in 2009, working through the 2013 crop year. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the numbers in red are the three years that are used in the Olympic average. So for prices here, we're dropping 2009. Uh, before we drop it, though, we replace the 355 price from 2009 with the 370. That still is the lowest price in those five years, so it drops out of the calculation. Likewise, the 2012 price of $6.89 is the highest of these five years. It drops out. And that's how you get to a five-year Olympic average of $5.30. On the yield side, you see the same thing. 2012 is the lowest yield number, and 2013 is the highest. So both of those drop out to get your five-year Olympic average. Multiply those together for benchmark. 86% of that is the guarantee. So again, using just a USDA estimate of $3.90 per bushel for corn, we just used a, a county trend yield, uh, just a, an estimate number of 180 bushels the acre. You see a guarantee of $702. That compares to your $783 guarantee to get the $81 payment. This is the county ARC program example again, getting to a benchmark of 669 and a guarantee of 86% uh, out of 575. Again, the red numbers are the ones that are used in the Olympic average calculation. Using a USDA estimate of 965 and a trend yield of 56, we would come up with a $540 per acre actual revenue compared to the 575. Going back on the uh, individual ARC, um, you'll see the, uh, the difference in the calculations this time is that we get to the revenues and then we do an Olympic average of the revenues. So if you're looking at the chart, you're going to calculate across before you calculate down, whereas uh, county ARC, you're going to calculate down before you calculate across. And there's the uh, actual calculations. Again, this individual ARC, you're adding the commodities together and you're weighting those revenues based on what was planted in 2014. 
So back to one of the earlier questions we had about whether or not your actual planting decisions in 2014 matter uh, for payments. It, th what you plant in 2014 does matter for individual ARC because what you plant will impact the revenue calculations in the, in the program based on that, that weighting. And here we just use 100 base acres with a 60-40 corn soybean split. So hopefully that helps out. The next question we have, um, are the irrigated and non-irrigated um, acres treated differently for the programs? That's a good question. What, uh, what we know is that in the statute there is a direction to the secretary. Uh, so this is a yet another one of those questions we have to answer with. Uh, um, it's going to depend on what the regulations say. But the statute does tell the secretary um, to the maximum extent possible and the maximum extent practical that the secretary has to calculate a separate actual crop revenue and agriculture risk coverage guarantee for irrigated and non-irrigated covered commodities. We don't know how that will work. That's, that's fully up to uh, the regulations, but we do know that the statute directs the secretary to try to the extent that, that it's possible to do so to calculate separate revenue numbers for irrigated and non-irrigated. That's not uh, on the price loss coverage program, however. Next question, where will individual ARC yield histories come from, crop insurance records or others? And what are the additional reporting requirements for county and individual ARC compared to PLC? So that's a great question. The, the yields, we don't know exactly what they're going to use, whether they're going to use crop insurance yields uh, for your farm. Uh, whether they're going to, uh, and this is this is for the individual ARC, the county ARC, of course, USDA will will calculate that uh, based on the county numbers. And probably, most likely, the, the National Agriculture Statistics Service or NASA's numbers for county yields. Your individual farm yields, um, you'll have to bring those in, uh, um, and, and and FSA will will use what you have on the farm. Not sure yet if um, if they're going to use or accept uh, crop insurance yields. Um, that's something for the agency to figure out uh, in, the in the rule making. I think the next question was whether or not there was uh, some uh, difference in reporting requirements. Um, I believe uh, there is a slight difference um, for individual ARC. You're going to have to report your yields and uh, information to FSA for individual ARC that you may not have to report for the uh, county ARC program. So there is likely to be some different reporting requirements, but again, much of that's going to be determined in the uh, rulemaking process when, uh, when FSA in, uh, provides instructions on how to use the programs. Uh, just one quick operating note. I think we're going to give ourselves a, a few more minutes. We have quite a bit of questions coming in. Um, so uh, if we got a few more, um, I think we've got a little bit left time left. I know we're, we're past uh, 9 o'clock central. Um, we've got a little bit of time left here. So if you got some more final questions. Uh, let's see, we've got one. Will FarmDoc be working on a decision spreadsheet for the programs? So yes, uh, the FarmDoc team will be working on um, uh, whatever we can, we can put together and, and try to come up with for uh, to help this decision. So everything from more posts on FarmDoc daily um, every Thursday, we're going to be doing a post on the Farm Bill specifically. Um, I think this week there'll be some dis some further discussion of the base acre uh, reallocation decision. Um, and as we are able to uh, to put things together, um, things like calculators or decision tools, um, certainly those are being looked at and worked on. Um, and we will try to get as much information out through the farm as we possibly can. Um, so stay stay tuned to those and. Um, and we will, uh, we will keep working on that information. And of course, uh, we will certainly be updating things as we know more from the, uh, from the agency, from USDA, um, on how these programs are going to operate. So we're getting some more SEO questions. Um, and I think the next one is, how will the insurance agent know if you're eligible to buy it? Well, that's a great question. Uh, my guess, and I hate to keep using the same answer, I feel like a broken record a little bit on whether or not 
we got to wait on the FSA regulations. But this one definitely will have to be worked out between FSA and RMA. Um, and they will be looking at how they basically share that information. Um, you know, the, uh, the agencies have worked, I think, extensively on trying to communicate and share information better. Um, so the anticipation is that uh, FSA would, would inform RMA, who could then inform crop insurance companies and agents about which producers are in which programs, uh, rendering them el ineligible for SCO. So somehow the agencies are going to have to communicate that to each other and then get that out uh, to the crop insurance agent. Remember that uh, what this matters for is the supplemental coverage option. Supplemental coverage won't be available until 2015. The decisions you make on Title I will be done sometime in 2014. Right now we're anticipating that being sometime this fall uh, for the 2014 crop year. So there will be time. You can't sign up for SEO this year anyway. So it's not a decision, and that, and that goes across the board. There's, there's nothing about these decisions that impact 2014 crop insurance. Uh, we've had a lot of farmers ask about that in meetings, and uh, you know, the, way, the way we're looking at that is the decisions you make for 2014 in crop insurance, whatever you're going to make before the Farm Bill passes, it's going to be what you make after this Farm Bill passed. You're going to deal with crop insurance for 2014 uh, in its own regard. And then sometime later in this year, you'll get into this Title I program decision, as we outlined here today. Um, and then that, that will be the program, the Title I program for the farm. And what it, what it will impact then, of course, is your SEO eligible, eligibility beginning in 2015. Um, but is, that is not something to, to be worried about this year. Um, SEO is not available in 2014. It's not available for the 2014 crop year. It's not part of the... Uh, sales closing date that is that is quickly approaching. So um, just one of those things to keep in mind. But uh, um, the way those programs will operate, um, a lot of that's still to be worked out. Let's see, the next question here: If tenant in a share arrangement wants individual ARC, but landowner wants county ARC, can that election be made? <laughs> Well, we, uh, again, understanding that a lot of the, the details of this decision will be worked out um, in the regulation. The way the statute reads is that it has to be a unanimous decision on the farm. So that's going to be the tenant and the landowner are going to have to reach an agreement on what that farm, what program that farm is going to be in. Uh, the penalty, if you will, or the, the downside to, to not making a unanimous decision is that the farm could forfeit any potential payments in 2014 and automatically be enrolled in the price loss coverage program beginning in 2015. So there is a big motivation for uh, landowners and tenants to, to reach an agreement, reach an agreement in a timely manner. That's one of the reasons why we're trying to get information out early so these conversations can begin. Um, and you can try and work it out with your landlord uh, well in advance of sign up as we get through uh, estimates of the programs and a better understanding of the programs. But it has to be a unanimous decision. And obviously, these are base acre programs. Um, that landowner that owns the base is going to have a very uh, important role. Exactly how that role is going to work or how that, uh, that decision-making process is going to work, um, we'll wait for FSA to provide us more guidance. But uh, what we do know is we, ha we have to reach a, a unanimous decision on that farm. So the landowner, the landlord, and the tenant uh, need to work together, need to uh, resolve that and, and come to a, an agreement on what program is going to operate on the farm. But they cannot be, they cannot be uh, putting different programs um, for, for the same crop on the farm. Next question we have, if land changes owners, not necessarily a tenant, during the farm bill, do we know anything about the ability to change the program decision? The one thing we do know for certain the statute says that farms cannot reconstitute. You cannot reconstitute your farm as a way to change or get around the decision. Now, that's, that's going to, you know, that, that's what the statute says. How that works out in practice and how that works out in the regulations, um, we don't know yet. Um, what happens when a farm is sold to a new owner? I, I don't have an answer for that one yet either. I think we're going to have to see how uh, FSA interprets this language. Um, but 
but it does apply uh, for something like a reconstitution. You cannot you cannot use that. Um, the way this statute reads, with emphasis on the fact that the decision is irrevocable for the life of the farm bill, um, I would think there'd be a lot of caution taken in um, how they treat uh, sales of land and and whether or not they allow that to to uh, permit program changes. But again, we just don't know the full details of that right now. Let's see. Farms with less than 10 base acres, are they ineligible? It's a great question. The 2008 Farm Bill uh, rendered farms that have less than 10 base acres, it rendered them ineligible. We have a slight change in uh, the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, it still applies to farms with less than 10 base acres. And I want to make sure I uh, double check this one real quick. Again, you can update, but you cannot add base. And farms with less than 10 base acres um, do not, the way they look at this, that actually goes through the, the payment acre calculation. So it's a little bit different than 2014. Um, and in essence, uh, farms with less than 10 base acres will not be getting payments uh, out of these programs. So again, similar to what we saw in, in 20. In 2008, farms of less than 10 base acres. There are exceptions for uh, for uh, socially disadvantaged and for uh, uh, other other farms, um, farms that have uh, resource challenges. And that uh, we have to look at the details from FSA on that one. But my understanding from the statute is that farms with less than 10 base acres uh, cannot get payments. If no payment, let's see, next question here. If no payments are triggered on Title I programs in a given year, do farmers still have to certify acres with FSA? If no payments are triggered, uh, again, that's going to be up to the agency. I don't know exactly how they're going to treat the certification um, process, uh, whether you have to certify acres with, with FSA. Uh, presumption is they're not going to change uh, a lot of that operation, but we'll have to wait and see what they, what they put together in the regulations. Let's see, 2002 Farm Bill allowed popcorn to be counted as corn. Is this still the case? Uh, what I do know is that, that popcorn is not listed as a covered commodity. So the initial uh, guess would be that that's not going to be uh, eligible for payments. Um, there is nothing about popcorn listed in the bill at this point in time. So I, I don't know anything further than that it is not listed as a covered commodity. and so. The initial presumption is it's not a, a, a crop that can receive a payment. But we'll have to wait and see what FSA says on that one. Let's see. We're almost uh, out of time here. I don't know if we've got any further questions. Um, one last one. Will husband and wife receive the combined 250? Yes. So this is the, uh, as is the case now, um, the payment cap, which is $125,000 across the PLC, ARC, and marketing assistance loan programs, all combined, that can be doubled with the spouse uh, the, way, the way that it's operated um, in the past. So in that case, the husband and wife uh, would have a combined payment limit of $250,000. And this looks like we have one last one here. Planted acres for a crop are less than the total base, and a payment is triggered. Does the payment get received on 85% of base for planted? Again, the payment for a PLC program is on 85% of the base acres for the commodity. A payment for the PLC or for the ARC county program is on 85% of the base acres for the commodity, and the individual ARC program is on 65% of the total base acres for the farm. Um, under PLC and county ARC, what is planted uh, does not have any impact on the payment, um, with the single exception of if you plant uh, vegetables, non-program crops on, on acres above that 15% uh, 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 flexibility range. But what, whether or not you plant the crop is not, for the for PLC and county ARC, is not going to determine um, your payments. And one last one here. Are base and payment yield update connected? Can you do one and not the other? 
great question. The way it looks in the statute is these are two separate decisions, and we've tried to frame them as two separate decisions. There's a base acre reallocation decision, and then there's a separate payment yield update decision. Uh, so it does appear from the statute, um, again, waiting to see what the regulations are from FSA. Uh, it does appear from the statute, at least, that those are separate decisions that can be made um, uh, without uh, one impacting the other. So the payment yields and the base update look to be, uh, you can choose one or the other or, or make both, both of the uh, revisions. And I think with that, um, we've reached the end of our time with, uh, with the webinar. Really appreciate everybody who has uh, taken time to, to uh, join us here today. Um, we want to remind everybody that uh, the Farm Doc website and Farm Doc Daily will continue to put out information and analysis on the farm bill, on the Title I programs and crop insurance. Um, and we will continue with webinars, including one next week, on the crop insurance, on the supplemental coverage option. Um, so this is the end of our event for today. Thank you again for attending and stay tuned as we have uh, future webinars and future analysis and information coming out from FarmDoc and FarmDoc Daily. Thank you.